Hello, I am Kyle Cherick, and I am here for the Chef Demo Series at Madison College, brought to you by Volrath, but more importantly, well, equally importantly, I am here with <laughs> Chef Heather Terhune, who is Executive Chef for Kimpton overall. No, just Trey Rivali Okay, Milwaukee. just Trey Rivali. <laughs> but you keep moving around the world, opening up new restaurants for them. I've been working for Kimpton for 20 years. And as you start to grow within the company, people ask you to help them do openings and trainings. So, I mean, I have a lot of experience and I know how to open Kimpton restaurants. I've yeah. had seven of my own, eight of my own with right. Kimpton in those years. So it's good to learn and know, kind of learn the ropes from someone who's done it, especially when you go through a new opening. Yeah, because I look at your Instagram and you're in Hawaii, you're in Amsterdam, you're here, you're there. I'm like, <laughs> I want to be Heather when I grow up. Well, some, some of it is pleasure, but yeah, <laughs> some of it, uh, Amsterdam was awesome. Uh, that was our first international property yeah. with Kimpton, and um, that was really an amazing experience. So you must be a key player, I'm just going to say, because you won't, <laughs> within, within the organization, if you're on the team that opens up the restaurant in Amsterdam. You know, I do as many as I can. I, they're really, I think people think it's like super, super easy. It's not. It's really hard work. You sometimes work harder than the teams that are on foot because mm -hmm. you're really trying to build the foundation so you can step away and then they can run a, and operate a Kempton property right. with the same standards. So your path is amazing to me and it's what I wish more chefs paths were. You went to a private culinary school, you went to work for a 20th century cooking legend. You moved around to great locations, great food cities, New Orleans. I'll let you tell the story. Yeah. And then uh, you got into America's seminal food city, Chicago, made a name, did television, yep. still, <laughs> still remained a nice person. That didn't change you, but the world beat a path to you. And then you took what I would call a secure job that still challenges you, but isn't full of limelight and glamour puss, where right. you, you, you still cook every day. Yeah. Where most people along that trajectory, chefs along that trajectory, yeah. are looking at spreadsheets and satisfying contracts to say that they have to be in their restaurant 12 right. days a month right. in all these different parts of the country, but they're not really still cooking. Right. So talk about your path. You can do a better job. Yeah. And then how you, how you got to where you are now. You know, I grew up in a, in a small town in Vermont, right outside Burlington, and I, my parents say I wanted to be a chef since I was four years old. We always got to choose a birthday dinner. I said I wanted artichokes and spare ribs. My family thought I was a little crazy, but they let me have artichokes and spare ribs. You know, I grew up really farm to table not knowing it. Mm -hmm. My parents were just being frugal. But Were we all just called food? Yeah, I mean, we <laughs> grew our own food. We yeah. canned, we pickled, my dad hunted, we foraged from mushrooms and fiddleheads and berries and my dad made sarsaparilla and wine and I was stomping on the grapes and you know all my siblings are great cooks I'm just the only one that wanted to do it as a career mm. um, and I always really knew that I wanted to be a chef I never wanted to be a doctor or a fireman or a teacher um, I just always wanted to cook yeah and I think well somewhere along the way I think my parents thought I'd change my mind but that didn't really happen and I think when something drives you with a passion you figure out a way to do it and never really let any obstacle stand in my way. I mean, I was working, you know, working my way through school. I went to college and then I went to culinary school. And when I was in culinary school in 1993, there was no internet. Honestly, it makes me sound so old, but there was no internet. There's no, they had no outside influences that were yeah, like. Yeah, I love the story of how you found <laughs> the three culinary schools you applied to. Yeah, I had the, I went, I saw in the back of Bon Appetit magazine. <laughs> Honestly, it's like it was CIA, Johnson and Wales in Rhode Island, and then yeah. New England Culinary. I applied to all three. I interviewed at all three. Ultimately, I chose New England Culinary. At that time, two campuses. I went to Essex Junction. It was a small student-teacher ratio, which they still do. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's as small. It was one one teacher and seven students. Wow. So it was a. Pri they were all private schools. That's like a bridge party. I mean, that's, that's like I a, mean, yeah, that's like a book club. If you want hands-on training, that's where you go. And I was like, I'll either do that or I'm going to take the money and I'll go to France. Um, but I thought that going to a culinary school was something I always dreamed about. Mm -hmm. um, and I really learned a lot. I'm close to chefs that were my instructors. That's how I got to New Orleans. One of my instructors was born and raised in New Orleans. That's how I started working for the Brennan family. Um, you know, as a young kid making six bucks an hour, you know, working in a Brennan restaurant, living in a, in a small, tiny basement apartment on a mattress on a floor, like 
but I didn't really care. But you were working in a Brennan restaurant, yeah. an American icon of cuisine, yeah, yeah. in one of the greatest food cities <laughs> in the world. And that was really, uh, New Orleans was a huge, huge part of what really made me the chef I am today. It yeah. taught me a lot about, you know, the I got, I had French culinary training, and the backbone of New Orleans cuisine is French cuisine. Sure. And that's something that I teach all of my 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 employees now is like, you know, it's awesome that there's all these new techniques and sous vide and uh, I always say this, I don't cook in bags. My chefs kind of they're like, you want to do that? I don't know, I don't cook in bags. I mean, we use the sous vide for certain things. I might cook an egg, we do some stuff. I let my sous chefs do it, but I teach techniques. But you're a pots and pans, I open am. fire, like you're yeah, what I'm, would be called I'm very rustic. old school yeah. that way. Like I'm very much about braising and teaching you would you will be shocked by how many people don't know the basics knife skills oh can we use a machine i don't use a we don't use a lot of mandolins or mm -hmm. equipment we don't use you know food processors to slice things everything we try to teach knife skills yeah if you don't have a, a school a really solid school like this how else are you going to learn we teach dishwashers how to become prep cooks and prep cooks to be line cooks but i think going to culinary school is something that i loved and that I would really encourage when somebody asks me, hey, what about culinary school? Work in a restaurant first, let's see if you like it mm -hmm. before you invest in, in that piece of it. I think education's always the way to go. So I wanna go back to your path and that you worked, uh, you, you, you went to a great school, but how instrumental that was then in the next step. I mean, it's still, you, cooking is a wonderful uh, uh, career because, <laughs> as I like to say, your BS has to walk. <laughs> If you say I've got this level of skill, yeah. you get into the kitchen by by halfway through the shift, everybody knows whether you do or you don't. Hundred percent. Yeah. So you. Hundred percent. You got to learn how to. I'm I'm very chatty, and that was something that I had to really learn. Working in real kitchens is you have to be quiet, mm -hmm. you have to listen, and follow directions, and that is very difficult for some <laughs> people. So I want to get back to the vitality of relationships yep. in your early career. So you go to this great culinary school. Then you get into an American iconic restaurant group, Brennan's in New Orleans. Uh, later, you cook for an American, uh, or 20, 20th century icon, Jean-Louis, uh, in Washington. Jean-Louis Paladin, like if, if you remove him from the history of culinary evolution, American at least, all these things that we take for granted in restaurants now are gone. And that was a relationship too. Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I don't think I realized it like at that time, like how important he was and how influential he was it's in probably cuisine. You didn't. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, I worked in the same kitchens as Eric Repair, and there's a lot of chefs that came out of that kitchen, and Roberto Dono mm -hmm, and Michel mm -hmm. Richard. These are all chefs that would. Dan you Barber, would, yeah. You'd all see them. They were all hanging out in the kitchen at the end of the night, just having a glass of wine, having food. And I learned so much about French cuisine and what the intricacies of ingredients and things I'd never seen before. Killing live eels, burning the hair off a boar's head because you're gonna make a terrine, like things that people would be like, oh my gosh, that's disgusting. And nothing's wasted. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing is wasted. Is wasted. The sweat on the boar from the flame. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much, it's used pretty much, in a and, sauce. <laughs> yeah, and you really learn about. I learned a lot about. I think we talked a little bit about farm to table and mm -hmm. resourcing, and you know, Jean Louis really brought that Hudson Valley, yeah. you know, Hudson Valley foie. You know, really looking at what could, what some stuff came from France, but really foraging locally in that area. And DC at the time was this hotbed of really amazing chefs. Yeah. And I was fortunate to be living and working there with him. And when he decided to close up shop and um, you know open a restaurant in Las Vegas mm -hmm. and then in New York, I knew it was time to go because yeah. that was always my focus. Go move to a city, try and work for the best chef that you can, learn as much as you can, and then move on. And I think that that was really, my parents thought I was nuts. They were like, you gotta settle down, you gotta stay in one place. But that's not how it was and shouldn't be for chefs. You really should, you know, move on and right. really hone your skills with other types of chefs so you can figure out what you want. People, people talk about it as a gypsy lifestyle, but I see it completely differently and I try to explain. So if you're a painter uh, in the 1500s, you know, you go to 
the Dutch Flemish area and you paint with this one and you paint with this one and you right. paint with this one and you work in their studios and then you end up a Delacroix and like it's <laughs> everyone's like oh aren't they amazing right. and it's like well yeah but they studied with this master this master this master this master right. and then found their own voice yeah and when you just like when I decided to you know I moved to North Carolina and I was working with Ben Barker and I ended up working with one of my friends and we went to culinary school together he was the chef I learned a lot and I decided I'm going to move to Chicago and I knew I wanted to live in a big city and I literally got a Zagat guide like everything was paper like I got a Zagat guide and I went through it and I decided I staged at Charlie Trotters and I did all these things and I knew that wasn't the type of cuisine I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I have a huge appreciation for it. I think Charlie Charter was a huge influence on my career and lots of chefs, mm -hmm. especially in Chicago and throughout the world. Yeah, um, yeah, no, but that, it was, that ripple kept going. Yeah, and I just thought, you know, this is a place where I'm going to, to work and live. I was like, five years, I ended up staying 18, but I was like, five years, I'm gonna stay here, I'm gonna work and live. And I was lucky because I came in in 1998 when Chicago was really starting to grow. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really yeah, you where, I, per perfect where time. I really honed and became, really worked on my career there and became a serious chef. And part of the way that I assembled this series was to try and bring in chefs like yourself. And then later in the series, we're gonna have Rick Tremonto. And if you, you know, Charlie Tremonto and Bayless kind of, well, not kind of, they made that. They are the Holy Trinity, yep. Holy Trinity of that city becoming an international food hub. Oh, yes. And without those three, you don't have an Ackett's and you don't have a Sarah Grunberg and you don't have like, you don't have all these people. You, you're just like. Yeah, Bill just, Kim, just at yeah. and Tori. I mean, I can yeah. name a right. <laughs> right. all There's these a, chefs that came through these kitchens. The graduating class. Yeah. yeah. That went on and on and on. But what? I wanted to have that shape and, and then turn to all of you, like I'm going to turn to you now and say, what do you wish you knew early in your career that you know now? One or two things. Just, oh, that would have made life so much easier or challenging but in a good way right. or, you know. I didn't realize, and I hate this, but I, I didn't realize like how few women worked in kitchens mm -hmm. when I decided to do it. I didn't care. And you know, when I was even in culinary school, there was maybe one, you might be the only one in your class, there were maybe 14 total out of 49. Um, I don't see it as a, like a, a an obstacle though. I always saw it as a, it made me stronger. Mm -hmm. um, all my closest friends are men. Um, I bond well with men, like I have a lot of great girlfriends, but the, there's just something about working in a kitchen full of dudes <laughs> that makes you want to beat them hmm. and makes you highly competitive. I'm always highly competitive, but you know, if I couldn't lift something, I would figure out how to get stronger. Cause I never want to be like, can you help me with this? I right. always just figured it out. I don't know if I knew then, I don't think it would change my mind, but I think that maybe I would have gone into it maybe a little less naive mm -hmm. um, about what this industry really is. I think it's great that there's more women going into it and sticking to it. You know, when I was going to school, there wasn't a specific pastry program. We learned pastries. That's something I teach my chefs now. And I think that that's what everybody needs to learn. There are not a lot of restaurants that can support a pastry chef's salary. Mm -hmm. So in order to be very versatile, I teach all of my sous chefs to learn. They know how to bake. They know basics. They know what a creme anglaise is, how to make caramel, how to make sponge cake, creme brulee. You need to know those things so you can go on and teach somebody else because you're not gonna have the luxury of having that. And it may get you a job and step you above the other 20 applicants. Oh, if you have pastry, I ask every sous chef that applies, do you have any pastry experience? And most of them are <laughs> like, if you say, I don't know, I don't deal with pastry, then that's probably the end of the line for yeah, you. Yeah. You have to show some interest in it yeah. at all. You know, what happens if somebody calls in sick, you gotta learn how to, right. you need to know how to make a chocolate cake. So you took on pastry at one point in your career. I did. Which is, you know, like for the longest time, and I find this incredibly wrong, but that's where like the women were put, it's true. right? I mean, that was the, oh, you're here for pastry. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm trying to think who, um, oh, it's a woman chef that we know it's a name, but anyway, she used to wear a t-shirt that she had made that said savory <laughs> on it that she would put on over her whites. Oh, that's awesome. Just so people would yeah. be like, 
I get it. Yeah. You know, I think when I moved to Chicago, I was like, I'm going to focus on pastry. I really didn't know what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And then I, I realized when I started working for Kimpton, I was a pastry chef and I, I quickly became bored. And then I realized, okay, I can do more things. It's yeah. not, this isn't my path. And then I was, you know, helping, I was doing sous chef stuff. And then that's how I ended up getting my very first executive chef job with Kimpton in 1999. Wow. Is that all these chefs kept coming through and they were, you know, it was the Hotel Burno, is teeny little hotel, 110 rooms and a small, Burnham. right? Yeah. Great little jewel Great, box yeah. right on State Street. Nothing was there. There was McDonald's. There was uh, Marshall Fields and uh, what, uh, like uh, Berghoff's. Yeah. There was really nothing down there. They were revitalizing. And I kept seeing all these chefs come through. I'm like, why does anybody want this job? I don't understand. And then they were like, do you want it? And I'm like, me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like 26. Wait, How can I? Yeah. I can't possibly run a restaurant. But I, they took a chance on me. I was scared to death. Yeah. I was 26. I had no idea what I was doing. But uh, the best advice I ever got was, if you don't take it now, if you don't take the leap, when are you ever going to do it? And that was advice I got from another chef friend of mine. And he's right. Yeah. Like, you have to take a leap of faith at some point, which is why when you have young cooks that you see potential in for sous chefs, well, it, somebody has to give them a chance, right? So why not, why not me? Why shouldn't I do it first before you move on to somebody else's it restaurant? It happens one of two ways, and I have studied thousands of chefs' careers. Yeah. It either happens where someone identifies for themselves that they are ready, and then it takes four years longer for the opportunity, <laughs> yeah. or like yours, where they're ready, but they have no idea that they are, oh, right. and greatness is thrust upon them, and they're, oh my God. And they, it they, was the perfect storm. I think like there was, it was a hotel, but no banquets. Yeah. It was only a restaurant, breakfast, lunch, dinner. They were like, it's small, it's 80 seats. But this little teeny little restaurant ended up being just gangbusters. Um, people were really looking and Chicago was growing rapidly. They were revitalizing state street and that was really a perfect opportunity. Paying attention. Yeah. It was yeah. this beautiful, tiny little, it's still there. It's no longer Kimpton's, but you know, it was this little jewel box of a restaurant. Yeah. It was so Parisian and yeah. French. Yeah. yeah. No, it was, it like was. American and comfort food at its best. And it was stylish <laughs> in a new way, which is what Kimpton does so well. A little plug for Kimpton, but yeah. I love their hotels because none are the same. And you walk in, you're like, this is quirky. I get it. I don't get it, but I'm comfortable. <laughs> And I don't know why I'm comfortable, right. but I like it. But I'm also like, what's around the corner? Yeah, you can, a lot of our hotels have these little surprises. Like yeah. you'll be, you'll see our living room. We don't call it a lobby. And you'll see, you know, an ottoman, but inside is filled with plastic dinosaurs. Right. Yeah. You know, so yes. it's like, it's so weird, yeah. but it works, yeah. right? But yeah, I love that about our company. So you are thrown on a plane to <laughs> someplace you don't know. And they tell you you're, you're like, you're, you're whatever, you're masked, you're handcuffed, you're, you know, <laughs> like, we're going to take you someplace, you're going to have to cook, and everything's going to be fine, but you have to cook, and you can tw name, you know, like a box full of cooking items, equipment, what do you take? How many things are going to have? Whatever you need, but it's like a medium-sized box. Oh, man. I mean, you're not going to have electricity, probably. No, 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 no. it's just like... But you, I wouldn't. I would think like you wouldn't have electricity, right? You, maybe... I you, would take a chef's knife, paring knife, serrated, a steel... I would take a peeler. What else? You don't need much. You'll have flame and like, we'll let's, say you have, let's say you have a gas oven. Gas oven, you need like, I would just take a, if I only got one piece of cooking equipment, I'd take a Dutch oven because you could do everything in it with a lid. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. No fresh pans, no. I mean, I would take a black steel pan if I could. I know, you always think about being minimalistic. <laughs> like, I always think of the things that I use at home too, right? I have a, a Dutch oven that stays a cast iron pan. We talked about this. Yeah. Like I cook in cast iron 90% of the time, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I'm very, I hate washing dishes. <laughs> so I love cast iron because you can just rub some salt in it. Totally. You never yeah. have to, yeah. maybe a little hot water. I literally hate washing dishes. So. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> there's going to be students here tonight and they're going to be soaking up your advice. But if you could pull them aside and say, like, just a couple things to know nowadays. Yeah. Not, not your path. Right. Not your coming up, but a couple things to know nowadays. What would they be? I think hone your knife skills. Mm -hmm. That is something, don't rely on equipment. Hone your knife skills. That's something that 
really like learn, be open-minded. I read as much as you can from cookbooks to magazines to just articles, be informed Mm -hmm. about what's going on in the industry. This industry changes rapidly. You have to know who is where, where they are, where are they moving, what's next. And I think trying to stay ahead of the curve is something that'll still keep you fresh and interested. And it'll give you, it'll give you an edge, I think, over others. And you don't need money. I think people think that, oh, to be a chef, it's expensive to go out to restaurants. You don't need a lot of money to eat in great restaurants. There's ways to do it. You can, you can stage in chef's restaurants, chef's kitchens. There's lots of ways. I always saved all my money when I was a student for cookbooks and eating out. Mm. And I didn't really, and travel. And if you can travel, save all your money, travel the world. You can do it inexpensively. Um, and I think that that's really what helped mold me is going to France, going to Italy, going to Spain, you know, yeah. traveling to, you know, anywhere, even regional, local, get in a car, go on a road trip and really try to experience different types of cuisine. When did you find, Heather, that you had, you had gotten your voice as a chef? Gosh, I feel like I'm always like still finding my voice. I think that I found my voice in 2010 uh, when I opened Sable, Sable Kitchen. Sable, I was going to say around the time of Sable. You know, it was a really. Uh, well, and that's what it was put a you on the map. Comp- it did. Yeah. It, I was really fortunate. You know, my, even my own company was skeptical, right? I'd been doing American comfort food for a long time, eight years, nine years. And you said it's time to get uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> and I knew I was like, look, I was ready for a new project I'd been in between, you know, I was at Atwood for 10 years and I was like, it's time to do something else. And they were like, I don't know if you can reinvent yourself. And that really kind of lit a fire in me. More of, oh, I will prove to you that I can do this. I will prove to you that this is a new type of cuisine. And we were opening a giant cocktail bar and I was like, you know, conceptually, I was like, why don't we do a restaurant where it's handheld food and it's not really fork and knife and it's it's all based off of two and four, two people, four people, and it's pieces and bites and they thought I was nuts. <laughs> and I was like, let's just try it. Let's just try sure. it. Sure. Let's not have a traditional, well, it's a hotel. Let's not have a traditional burger or a chicken entree or things, a salmon that everybody wanted. Because we've all seen that. Well, you don't need it. Yeah. You don't need it. And I think that that really was the way that that we started to see culinary change. And then once we rolled out and we did this restaurant, it was hugely successful. You started to see all these other bars. Right. We did high volume too. It was high volume cocktail bar and food. So that was a really that was a really pivotal point I think in my career. Yeah. Cool. And then again, moving to Milwaukee and doing, you know, I've never cooked Mediterranean cuisine before. I've traveled to these countries, but I never really focused on it. So again, like trying to reinvent yourself, break apart, do things that are scary. Mm-hmm. And I think get out of your comfort zone. If you keep, it's so boring to do what you always do. Yes. And I think like in life and in culinary world, try new things. Be different. Try new techniques. You know, my own sous chefs have taught me things about sous vide, things I never was interested in before. But I think Which it's you kind of co- have one of these again, too, <laughs> by the way. Yeah, you kind of wear the garlic around your neck yeah, relative I mean, to molecular. Yeah, because I'm always like, I know I cook traditional, but there's always something to learn. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think that that's what I've learned. Oh, this you know, is a good idea. Karam used to sous vide <laughs> in pig's bellies yeah. and boiling water. So it's really more traditional than you think. Yeah, I mean, we were cryovacking in uh, 1995 in Jean-Louis, yeah. and, but drop not using an immersion circulator, just dropping in boiling yeah. water, or water, you know, yeah. doing things where it was, it was always around. Right. I think it has its purpose. And a now lot. you can buy them on Amazon. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's the was the hot gift I think last yes, Christmas, yes. right? Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. 